What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. Now, I've heard many say that God doesn't really love the Gentiles or that he never intended to save the Gentiles and that he only came to save the children of Israel and that's the only people that he actually loves. But, if we search the Old Testament, specifically the Torah, meaning the Pentateuch or the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that nice chunk of the Old Testament, we're given seven feasts that each point forward to being fulfilled by something in the New Testament and are prophesied in the New Testament. So, with that said, I have to be honest about something. This was probably the hardest script I've ever had to write ever in my life because usually you know the bible comes very easy to me and I don't really have to try very hard and I just kind of understand scripture and that's not just that's not me trying to be cocky or sound prideful or whatever but we've all been given spiritual gifts and each are special and important in their own way as Paul explains in first corinthians chapter 12 And so the reason that I say this is because for some reason I find the feast very difficult to understand. Like no matter how many times my dad tries to explain the feast to me, my brain just shuts down whenever he starts talking about it. So to say the least, this was a very, very difficult script for me to write. And it took a long time. But with the help of my dad, I've been able to better understand the feasts and what they foreshadow. For instance, you know, the feast of Passover was the prophesying or foreshadowing of Easter. And with that said, the Gentiles being grafted into the vine was prophesied in the Feast of Weeks or Shavat. So quick little shout out to my dad. Thanks for the help. Okay, so how can we be sure that the Gentiles being grafted into the vine was prophesied in the Feast of Weeks or Shavat. Well, let's just read the scripture. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 15 through 22. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year, old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So a couple things I want to point out to you guys. First is that this is one of two times you see the Lord require leaven for an offering to the Lord. Every other time, God specifically says, do not add leaven. And in some instances, to not have leaven, even in your home or even in the borders, within the borders of Israel for the full seven days of the feast. The reason I point this out is because leaven is almost always representative of sin. Here's a few instances of this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 5 through 12. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch 
and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, Oh, you, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you brought no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And now let's take a quick look at Paul's writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So now with that said, why would God have his people add leaven to their bread as an offering to him if leaven is almost always representing sin? Well, I believe that God was foreshadowing the grafting in of the Gentiles into the sheepfold of Israel. Gentiles are anyone who are not Jews. And Jews were meant to represent the clean, righteous people of the earth, while Gentiles represented the sin-ridden, unrighteous people. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So, could this have been God's way of foreshadowing the ushering in of the Gentiles to the sheepfold by having them bring in or present bread with leaven? Just a thought. Now the second thing I want you to notice is that this is 50 days after the first Sabbath after Passover. So this is a perpetual Sunday. And what's so significant about that? Well, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he focused on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 7. These 12, Jesus sent out instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And again in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 24, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying have mercy on me O lord son of david my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon but he did not answer her a word and his disciples came and begged him saying send her away for she's crying out after us he answered i was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of israel jesus even took it a step further and called her daughter a dog and for more on why jesus answered her like this check out our video the little dogs and the Syrophoenician woman, which is under our nuggets of truth category. Now, all of this was said and done prior to his death and resurrection. Jesus and his disciples only went to the house of Israel. They only went to the Jews. Now check out what Jesus says after his death and resurrection. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When Jesus called Paul, 
who was then known as Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee, he told Ananias this in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Prior to Jesus' death and and resurrection, Gentiles weren't 100% a part of the sheepfold. Sure, they lived among, you know, they lived in Israel among the Jews, but they weren't truly a part of the Jews. They weren't truly a part of the children of God. Now, because of the blood of Jesus, the Gentiles can now be counted as one with the Jews. We've now been grafted into the vine. So the third thing I want you to notice is the timing of the harvest. The Feast of Weeks, or Shavat, was the beginning of the wheat harvest. Now this is important because, as my dad explained in his upcoming message, this is Pentecost, which you should check out this Pentecost Sunday, that the wheat and barley harvest were both planted at the same time, but were reaped at different times. And what's so significant about that? Well, barley represents Israel. Let me prove it to you. Judges chapter 7, verse 12 through 14. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the sea, that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat and his comrade answered this is no this is no other than the sword of Gideon the son of Joash a man of Israel God has given into his hand Midian and all the camps so we can be sure then that barley represents Israel. And as barley represents Israel, wheat represents the Gentiles. When Jesus was preaching about, when Jesus was preaching and teaching in Bethany after the day after the triumphal entry, before the time of Passover, some Gentiles, Greeks, they were Greeks, Gentiles, Greeks, yeah, they came seeking him. And I, and I really want you to pay attention to Jesus' answer. John chapter 12, verse 20 through 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. These, So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus compares the Gentiles to wheat. He was prophesying their redemption. This is right before the Passover. This is right before he dies and then resurrects. So he's now giving them hope. That if they follow him, if they deny themselves, if they lay down their own desires, their own flesh, if they crucify their flesh, then they would find salvation. They would be saved. So the barley represents the Jews, Israel, and the wheat represents the Gentiles. And just as both the Gentiles and Jews were established at the same time, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest were both planted at the same time. Now, even though they were both planted at the same time, like I said earlier, they were not reaped at the same time. The barley harvest was reaped first. And let's take a quick look at Exodus chapter 9, verse 31 through 32. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the air and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the emer were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. 
This is the foreshadowing of the redemption of the world. Salvation came first to the Jew and then the Gentile. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 116. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here's another thing I want you to notice about the Feast of Weeks. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 22 and when you reap the harvest of your land you shall not reap your field right up to its edge nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner I am the Lord your God. God made sure that his people left enough for not only the poor who couldn't afford to have land but also for the sojourner in other words the Gentile and look what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. God made sure that there was in always enough for the Gentile because God shows no partiality between Jew and Gentile. Now the last thing I want to mention that I think is kind of interesting and cool is that it's during the barley harvest that Ruth, the Moabite, makes the decision to return with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and follow her God and her ways. Look, Ruth chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Now, look at when they returned to Israel. Ruth chapter 1 verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Fun fact, Bethlehem is also where Jesus was born. All right. So what's so significant about Ruth other than, you know, the fact that she's a Gentile? Well, just stay with me for a second. Ruth, a Gentile. Though she decided to follow Naomi and put away her past culture, gods, and people to become one with Naomi and her people, it wasn't until after the wheat harvest that she was actually redeemed. Ruth chapter 2 verse 22 through 23. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women lest in another field you be assaulted so she kept close to the young women of boaz cleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest and she lived with her mother-in-law now whilst while they were winnowing the barley keep in mind this is after the wheat harvest ruth went to boaz as naomi instructed her to do and laid at his feet he then promised that she would be redeemed and he would settle the matter in the morning and boaz redeems ruth the next day just as he said ruth chapter 4 verse 9 through 10 then boaz said to the elders and all the people you are witnesses this day that have bought from the hand of naomi all that belonged to elimelech and all that belonged to chilean killian and to malone also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malone, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. What's so significant about all of this? At the beginning of barley harvest, when salvation was first presented to the Jews, Ruth made the decision to follow Naomi and her God. But it's not until after both the barley and wheat harvest is complete, while they are now winnowing the barley, that Ruth is fully redeemed. She is now 100% redeemed. See, it's prophesied that Jesus will take his winnowing fork and clear the threshing floor and bring the wheat harvest into the barn. Now, I know these are two different harvests. Ruth is redeemed 
the same day as they are winnowing the barley and the prophecy of Jesus speaks about the wheat harvest. But here's what I'm what I want you to understand and I know this is this is about to get a little deep, but I want you to stay with me for a minute. These are speaking of the same harvest. The barley harvest represents the Jews, right? Well when we Gentiles, when we are redeemed, we are brought into the sheepfold as spiritual Jews, spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 through 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, when Boaz was winnowing the barley, he was weeding it out if you will, the pests from the grain. He was foreshadowing Jesus separating the sheep and the goats on the day of judgment, which we'll, you know, we'll talk about more in another video. But this is the same day that Ruth is redeemed. And Ruth then went on to be the great grandmother of King David, which means she was one of the ancestors of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. The fact that one of Jesus' ancestors was a Gentile who was redeemed by her kinsman redeemer Boaz after the barley and wheat harvest while he was winnowing the barley is quite the foreshadowing of Jesus redeeming every one of the Gentiles who would bow their knee and worship him. And for more on Jesus being our kinsman redeemer and what that means, check out our mini video series, Kinsman Redeemer, which is under our Nuggets of Truth category. So just to sum everything up for you guys... From the very beginning, God intended to save the Gentiles. From the day he called Abraham to the day he gave the feasts and so on. God's desire is that none should perish but all come to acceptance. Why? Because we are all God's children. We are all his workmanship. He prophesied or foreshadowed the redeeming of Gentiles through the Feast of Weeks or Shavat, when he had them offer bread of leaven. 50 days after the first Sabbath, after the feast of Passover, because that's when Jesus made a way for the Gentiles to be saved. He also foreshadowed the redemption of the Gentiles when he had the Jews gathered the harvest first, but leave enough for the sojourners of the land. I hope you all enjoyed this video and that, you know, we answered any questions you may have had about the Feast of Weeks or the foreshadowing of the Gentiles being redeemed. If you feel maybe we didn't explain everything as well as we could have maybe we left something out let us know in the comment section below but if you enjoyed this video please feel free to like comment share and subscribe to our channel and until next time god bless